Venice, 1522, capital of tolerance and Renaissance, and the center for smugglers dealing in the banned literature of the Protestant Reformation. The church's most powerful weapon will be a new type of inquisition, controlled by the Pope himself. He will use it to curtail the spread of a competing religion and eliminate those who betray the faith. It will stop the flow of new ideas let loose by the printing press and repress the birth of modern scientific thought. A new campaign in the battle for the souls of Europe's Christians is about to begin. Venice, 1522. The central hub of Europe's major trade routes, the city of Venice offers an open exchange of goods and ideas. And it is a diverse society. The tolerance of the Venetians and their commitment to commerce encourages an influx of people from all religions and nationalities. It is a republic among the collection of independent states that challenge the authority of the church in Rome. Venice is also the publishing capital of Europe. Millions of books are printed and sold here. The unorthodox ideas spread by the new print medium will bring the wrath of the Roman Inquisition to Venice. The secret files of the Inquisition reveal just how serious the consequences of independent thought could be for men like the Franciscan friar, Baldo Lupitino. Father Lupitino's beliefs are shifting away from the Roman Catholic Church, from the transcript of Father Baldo Lupitino. I believe in the truth of the Holy Scriptures, but I do not believe in the authority of the Pope or his councils, as they are merely human beings. The Pope is merely the bishop of his own church, not all churches. Father Lupitino has embraced the teachings of the dissident German monk, Martin Luther. Martin Luther is about to mount the Protestant Reformation. He challenges the authority of the Pope in Rome. He is highly dissatisfied with the papacy's obsession with material wealth and profits. The 16th century is the period in which the uh, uh, exploration of the wider world begins and the Protestant Reformation divided Western Christianity. Rome, 1522. The seat of power for the Roman Catholic Church. For Pope Leo X and his court, obsessed with worldly pleasures, it is business as usual. No extravagance is too large. His most ambitious project is the rebuilding of St. Peter's Cathedral and its massive dome, a monument to honor his papacy and the glory of Rome. The project will bankrupt the church. Preoccupied with the building of St. Peter's, Leo X dismisses Luther's threat by excommunicating the German monk. This weak reaction to Luther's acts of heresy doesn't sit well with the most severe and rigid of the Pope's servants, Bishop Giovanni Pietro Carafa. 
Carafa is appalled at the moral and spiritual rot eating away at the heart of the papacy. He believes in the power of the church and its sacred duty to control its flock with an iron fist. For six years, while in Spain as the Pope's ambassador, Carafa had seen firsthand how to deal with those, like Luther, who stray from the flock. Bishop Carafa is impressed by the power of the Spanish Inquisition to correct the errors of its people. For almost 40 years, it has held them in its grip. Heresy is the plague of the soul and must be rigorously crushed. As we burn plague-infected houses and clothes, so we must drive out heresy and cleanse the soul, which is so much more valuable than the body. Giovanni Pietro Carafa is a very good example of the kind of man who would eventually save the Roman Catholic Church. Staunch Catholic, firm believer, a man disgusted by the uh, corruption at the court of successive popes. Uh, he was an example of someone who really wanted to reform the Catholic Church on the one hand and restore it on the other. Carafa is concerned that the papacy under Leo X is weak and that the pope is too preoccupied to implement an inquisition on the Spanish model. special order of men meet to discuss the state of the church. A new order of monks, the Theatines, organize. They have one mission, to attack the enemies who threaten the power of Rome. All members have taken a solemn oath to fight Martin Luther and all others who oppose the strict doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. Leading through example, they also take an oath of complete poverty and rely solely on the grace of God for their needs. They will stop at nothing to fight evil, both outside and inside the church. To their leader, Bishop Carafa, his destiny is clear. He has been chosen by God to exterminate all heretics. But for Carafa's church, the worst is yet to come. For men like Carafa, the zealots, as they're called, this was uh, a personal uh, mission uh, to revive the Roman Catholic Church. They were people who felt very definitely that Europe had taken a wrong turn, that the barbarians were at the gates. May 6th, 1527, the heretics come crashing through the gates. Germanic armies from the north attack Rome. Now the threat is more than spiritual. The Pope's territories have been invaded. After seven days of murder and pillage, the capital of Christendom is destroyed, and 12,000 Romans are dead. After controlling Europe for more than a millennium, the Roman Catholic Church, the most powerful religion on earth, is on the brink of collapse. Venice, 1529. The import of Protestant literature through the port city threatens to infect the entire Italian peninsula. A cardinal writes to the Pope, Today, the city of Venice, which used to be truly Christian, is very much poisoned by the Lutheran plague. It has taken over the minds of those who govern, of those who write, or any order of persons. The Protestant heresy is even spreading among the ranks of the Catholic clergy. Father Lupatino is a regular customer of the Venetian booksellers, continually searching for the forbidden literature that fuels his spiritual quest. 
He has even written his own 16 articles of faith. Bishop Carafa has been sent to Venice to investigate reports of rampant heresy. Carafa is distressed at what he finds. This is exactly the heresy Carafa seeks to destroy. The spiritual friar Lupatino will become the target of his vengeance and an example of the fate of heretics in the Republic of Venice. The essence of the conflict between Venice and Rome really is a matter of Venetian autonomy. Venice is a republic. It jealously guards its control over Episcopal nominations within its land empire. Uh, these are usually in the hands of the uh, families of the ruling Venetian uh, patriciate. And it simply doesn't want to be dominated by Rome. On the other hand, of course, Rome is alarmed by the spread of heresy within Venice's land empire, and it wants quick action against the heretics. The University of Padua, 33 kilometers west of Venice. famous for academic excellence and intellectual freedom. But to the church, the university is a hotbed of heresy to be investigated and purged. Advances in science, and particularly the teaching of anatomy, contradict the most fundamental Catholic beliefs. At the University of Padua, students learn about the human body in a scientific and systematic way, through dissection of the body. What scholars embrace as the birth of modern medicine, the church condemns as the work of the devil. One of those enchanted by the possibilities of this new science is a medical student named Girolamo Donzellino. Donzellino is simply overwhelmed by the knowledge that is revealed in clandestine medical classes at the university. His increasing thirst for forbidden knowledge will set Donzellino on a collision course with the Roman Catholic Church. Across the Adriatic Sea, on a small island at the far reaches of the Venetian Republic, Protestant heresy has taken hold. In just a few years, Father Baldo Lupatino has built a small and devoted congregation at the Cathedral of Cheros. His inspired and direct preaching style has won over most of the locals. He tells his followers that they can talk directly to God, that they do not need the clergy as middlemen. His teachings are dangerously similar to those of Martin Luther, the great enemy of the church. Confessing to a priest, my brothers and sisters, is good and useful. But only God can forgive our sins and cleanse us from every wickedness. Without a sincere confession to God, no other kind is valid, even if it is to the Pope. Lupatino's sermons betray important Catholic dogmas. To add insult to injury, they are delivered not in Latin, the language of the church, but in the local vernacular. To the church, it is an act of utter blasphemy. Not all locals are won over by Lupatino's Lutheran preaching. A member of his congregation, Jacopo Curzola, denounces him to the authorities in Rome. From the testimony of Jacopo Curzola. 
Fra Lupetino preached in the cathedral during the past Lent with so much scandal that I am compelled to report to the judges of his heresy. He turned the whole town upside down, and only a little would have been required to make the entire population heretic. At 60 years of age, Bishop Carafa is promoted to the rank of Cardinal. After the Pope, Carafa holds the most powerful position in the Catholic Church, and the Church desperately needs his help. In less than 20 years, the Protestant Reformation has converted much of Europe. Carafa convinces Pope Paul III that it is critical to stamp out the Protestant heresy. He offers the new pontiff a solution an inquisition to eliminate heretics not in France or Spain, but at home in Rome and throughout the Italian peninsula. And this is an extraordinarily important development. For the first time, you find institutionalized inquisition. For the first time in the 16th century, the Holy See created a body uh, for this purpose as one of the secretariats assisting the Pope. Carafa assumes leadership of the Inquisition. Before funds are even released from the treasury, he commandeers a large palace at his own expense across the river from the Holy See. He personally supervises the installation of interrogation chambers and prison cells. Now, backed by the power of the Inquisition, Carafa appears unstoppable in his quest to protect the interests and morals of the church. Even if my own father were a heretic, I would gather the wood to burn him. The power of the Inquisition will soon extend from Rome to the farthest reaches of the Italian peninsula. In the Venetian Republic, Carafa's first victim is Father Baldo Lupetino. He is taken to face the tribunal of the Venetian Inquisition. October 27th, 1542. The Inquisitor demands to know if Lupatino recognizes the Pope as the head of the church in Rome. From the transcript of Baldo Lupatino. I believe in the truth of the Holy Scriptures, but I do not believe in the authority of the Pope or his councils, as they are merely human beings. The papal envoy demands a public execution to serve as a warning to other clergy. Fravaldo Lupetino should be tied between the columns of the Piazza of St. Mark's and beheaded. His body should then be burned on the spot, and then his ashes thrown into the sea for the honor and the glory of Christ. But the Venetians are reluctant to execute the Lutheran-leaning monk. It would send the wrong signal to the Republic's trading partners. It would simply be bad for business. The Venetian Inquisition, when it was formed, was never, of course, fully under the control of Rome. Rome appointed the Venetian Inquisitor, uh, usually from people suggested from the Republic, but the Venetian Inquisition really remained firmly under the control of Venice's own patriciate. As a compromise, the tribunal sentences Lupatino to indefinite imprisonment. He is sent to a remote, isolated cell far from the city. The Inquisition has barely begun.
Venice, 1546. The long arm of the Roman Inquisition has created a climate of fear in the northern port city. Those who oppose the doctrines of the church are hunted down and silenced. In Venice, the hub of European publishing and bookselling, this crackdown drives the trade of banned literature deep underground. But illicit books still make their way into Venice from Northern Europe. One of the key links in the Venetian book smuggling ring is the recent University of Padua graduate, Girolamo Donzellino. Our own age is so curious about the religious questions that we are not satisfied with the beliefs of our elders. And this is especially true of those of us who are well educated and interested in books, because we are constantly seeking out new teachings. It was much easier for the church to keep control of theology when books were extraordinarily costly and uh, the only people who could afford to have many of them were the churches and monasteries. Uh, as soon as the printing press made uh, uh, the pocketbook available to anybody with a couple of coins, uh, it was much, much more difficult to keep the lid on. This new media had emerged, uh, spewing out tens of thousands of books of all kinds, including uh, vernacular translations of scripture and stories of the saints and law books and other kinds of treatises and theological works and so on without any kind of limitation. Vincenzo Valgrisi and his sons are among the most reputable publishers and booksellers in Venice. 450 years later, Valgrisi editions will be worth thousands of dollars. Valgrisi regularly acquires heretical books from the physician Donzellino and distributes them to a growing list of clients throughout the Italian peninsula. For Donzellino and Valgrisi, the risks are enormous. Just one book could deliver them into the hands of the Inquisition. A high price to pay for the spread of knowledge. A price known all too well by Father Baldo Lupatino. His last four years have been spent rotting away in his dank cell. The princes of Germany, now followers of Martin Luther, write to the Pope, protesting the degrading, inhumane treatment of Lupitino. Carafa responds in a rage. From his point of view, Lupitino's punishment is far from sufficient. He is determined to make an example of the heretic friar, and soon there will be nothing to stop him. May 23, 1555, following the death of Paul III, Cardinal Giovanni Pietro Carafa becomes Pope Paul IV. The architect of the Roman Inquisition now holds all the power. He wastes no time in using it. Protestant heretics are hunted down and executed. Blasphemy, sexual misconduct, Failing to observe fasts, all are fair game for the roving eye of the Inquisition. The Pope turns his attention to the University of Padua. Pope Paul IV pressures the city to purge the heretics from its university. The Roman Inquisition focuses on books, on science, on uh, anything which would shake the church's traditional view of man as the center of the universe and as the Catholic Church in Rome uh, with the Pope as its emperor. Many professors have already fled from the threat of investigation. The Inquisition suspects that their students have been tainted by their Protestant poison. One of these is civil law student Pomponio Algerio. 
The 24-year-old is ordered to present himself before the local Inquisition Tribunal. The Tribunal hears that Pomponio has indeed been converted to the Lutheran cause. All cases of the Inquisition were documented in meticulous detail. These were essentially legal proceedings and had to follow a certain kind of form, and the Church and the Inquisitors were very conscious that it, it was crucial to follow that form. He wears his academic cap and gown to remind the Tribunal that, as a student, he has the right to freely express his ideas. From the transcript of Pomponio Algerio. I say that the church deviates from the truth insofar as it says that a man can do anything in any way good on his own, since nothing praiseworthy can proceed from our corrupt, infected nature except to the extent that the Lord God gives us his grace. Before the Inquisition Tribunal, Pomponio refuses to abjure. The Roman Catholic is a particular church, and no Christian should restrict himself to any particular church, since this Roman church deviates in many things from truth. Guardia. He is sentenced to prison and told to reconsider his beliefs. The Inquisition sought to define the actual nature of the crime, to bring forth evidence, to have procedures for interviewing witnesses and the accused, and so on. So in, in a certain sense, you could say the Inquisition pro provided a model uh, for proper legal procedures. But in prison, Pomponio's beliefs his Lutheran convictions only grow stronger. He writes secretly to his fellow students. To my most beloved brothers, fellow servants of Christ. I must tell you that I have found comfort in a dark cave, serenity and hope in a place of bitterness and death. For he who had been far away is with me now and offers me his hand. I am in the company of those who have been crucified, stoned, hunted, blinded, beheaded, or sent to the flames. It has been written, if we are accused in the name of Christ, we will be blessed. For the honor and virtue of God rest on ye. Goodbye, fellow servants of God. Be strong and pray for me unceasingly. The Roman Inquisition is about to transform the idealistic student into a martyr and a legend. In the midst of the Protestant attack, Paul IV opens a second front with an attack on an historic scapegoat of the church, the Jews. It is absurd that the Jews, who have been condemned to eternal slavery through their own fault, can show such effrontery that they venture to not only dwell among Christians, but even near their churches and without dressing to distinguish themselves. According to Christian theology, traditionally, the Jews were cast out, were seen as the people who would wander the face of the earth forever without a land of their own, and their own miserable existence would testify to the fact that they were following a failed theology, were not in fact recognizing the true God, the true theology of the Christian faith. Twenty-three pontiffs prior to Paul IV had guaranteed protection of the Jews and upheld their special place in Catholic theology. Under Paul IV's regime, that protection is no more. July 12, 1555, barely two months into his reign, Pope Paul IV issues an extraordinary papal bull, 
that overturns centuries of tolerance towards the Jews of Italy. Sixty years earlier, close to 9,000 Jews fleeing the Inquisition in Spain and Portugal had been welcomed into the Papal States by the Pope himself. My family escaped from Spain in 1492. They came to in Rome, invited by the Pope Alexander VI Borgia, the Pope at that time. The church encourages the Jews to set up businesses. Their skills are seen as a boon to local economies. But now, with Paul IV's bull, those once welcomed Jews are condemned to live in walled ghettos, identified by distinctive hats and badges. Every night at sundown, they are to retreat to the ghetto and remain there under lock until the next day. And inside, inside in the ghetto, the Pope closed 3,900 people. The Jews, they were allowed to go outside, but with special permission. My family remained closed in ghetto area for 300 years. 300 years, 300 years of difficult period. The Inquisition publishes an edict ordering the collection and burning of all copies of the Talmud, a book of interpretations of the Hebrew Bible. Thousands of rare and ancient manuscripts are reduced to ashes. In 1557, Jews are forbidden to own any Hebrew books except their Bible, known to Christians as the Old Testament. The edict states, once these books are removed, it will soon result that the more the Jews are without that wisdom of their rabbis, so much the more will they be prepared and disposed to receiving the faith and the wisdom of the word of God. The Talmud is seen by the church as a dangerous document because the interpretation that it gives to many of the stories and the prophecies in the Hebrew Bible run contrary to later Christian interpretation of those prophecies, particularly with regard to the divinity of uh, Jesus, uh, his miraculous birth, uh, the salvation of the soul, and a variety of those kinds of things. From this point, the Inquisition becomes the most powerful institution of the church. We are of the opinion that no tribunal is more honorable or works with greater zeal for the glory of God than the Inquisition. And we have therefore resolved to refer everything to it that is connected with the articles of faith or can be brought into relation with them. The Inquisition comes about as part of the Counter-Reformation. And the major part of this is to introduce greater central control from Rome over all of Christendom. In September 1556, in his quest to restore the unity of Christendom, Pope Paul IV takes care of some unfinished business. After spending the last 14 years of his life in solitary confinement for preaching Lutheran heresy, Father Baldo Lupatino is taken out of his cell. Pope Paul IV calls for his public execution. But the Venetian leaders, fearing a public execution would threaten commerce with Northern Europe, request that the friar's execution be carried out in secret, making it easier to deny later. The condemned man is taken in a gondola, attended only by a sailor and a priest. Out in the Venetian lagoon, the prisoner, chained and attached to a heavy stone, is forced onto a plank between two gondolas. Then, on a signal, the sailors row away from one another and return to Venice without looking back. Father Baldo Lupatino's long ordeal has come to an end.
Next on the Pope's list is the student from Padua, Pomponio, Algerio, who has spent the last year of his life behind bars. Because Venetian authorities will not consent to an execution, Paul IV forces officials to extradite Pomponio to Rome, where he will be handed over to the secular authorities. The church itself never executes anyone. When the Inquisition flourished as an institution, it was in societies almost all of which depended absolutely on religious, a kind of religious uniformity as well as uniformity in other matters. So the state saw itself as having an interest in enforcing orthodoxy. This to us is now practically unthinkable and for most of us, undesirable. August 21st, 1555. A monk from the Brotherhood of St. John the Beheaded visits the young student, urging him to repent. If he renounces his heretical beliefs, he will be strangled before burning to spare him the excruciating death. Father Francesco Pagini records the encounter. Pomponio although having been exhorted to repent, was increasingly perfidious in his obstinacy. He did not want to confess his sins, nor did he want to listen to the Holy Mass. August 22nd, 1556. Pomponio is taken to Piazza Navona. The Inquisition has devised a new method of execution. He is to be boiled alive in a container of oil, tar, and turpentine. This is what I've always sought from my Lord. May he live forever. Receive me, O Lord, your servant and martyr. He survives for 15 minutes before death finally takes him. The Venetian ambassador files a report on the event. On this day, the student Pomponio went to his death in Piazza Navona. He displayed so much steadfastness in the face of death that everyone was in awe. of freedom of conscience is highly refined at our time in history. It wasn't as clear in the past. You see, in the past, because so much was at stake for the person, that is, attaining salvation or not, they, it was felt that one had to enforce orthodoxy even if people re were resisting it, as we would say, for their own good. August 18th, 1559. Church officials and dignitaries gather in the papal chambers to pay their final respects to the 83-year-old pontiff. A cardinal witnesses his last moments on earth. At the 12th hour, he called all the cardinals together about him and commended to their care the Inquisition in the name of Jesus Christ. The Pope's heart is barely stopped when the people of Rome pour onto the streets to celebrate his demise. The devil who brought the violence and the torture of the Inquisition to Italy is no more. 
mobs of Romans attacked the palace of the Inquisition, freeing dozens of prisoners from their cells. The mob breaks into the archives of the Inquisition and destroys many of its secret files. The likeness of Pope Paul IV, father of the deadly Roman Inquisition, is dispatched to the bottom of the Tiber River, where it will lie undisturbed for the next 300 years. But the Pope's legacy is very much alive. Months before his death, Paul IV publishes a specific list of books banned by the Church. The Index Librorum Prohibitorum seeks to put an end to the reading of books that could potentially corrupt the faithful. Only Catholic texts and approved secular books are to be bought, sold, and read. No new book is to be published anywhere in Italy without the Church's approval. The Index of Prohibited Books, of course, was a major instrument uh, of thought control and of restricting the flow of, of information and ideas, uh, particularly, of course, cracking down on this new instrument, the printing press. I mean, there really hadn't been any kind of system, systematic censorship in place anywhere in Europe. But you see, in a way, it's preferable to make a judgment about a book rather than to make a judgment about a person. So as to say, you see, the Inquisition tended to concentrate on whether a person was a heretic, the index, of, the index concentrated on the content of their book. In Venice, at the heart of European printing and publishing, the Holy Office has been able to enforce the index of prohibited books with great success. Following the creation of the list, the Inquisition steps up its efforts by conducting random searches of Venetian bookshops. An informer's tip leads the Holy Office to the publishing house of Algrisi and Sons. The files of the Venetian Inquisition contain this denunciation. I was at the bookshop when Don Zalino and Giorgio Valgrisi were discussing prohibited books. Giorgio put his finger to his lips as a signal that he should be quiet. But Don Zalino boasted that he held on to his despite the Holy Office. More than 1,100 prohibited volumes are found enough evidence to put both men away for life. Among the confiscated volumes are editions of the Bible, translated from the church-approved Latin into German and Italian. At his trial, Valgrisi's neighbors and the parish priest testify that he is a good Catholic. Ironically, he uses as part of his defense that he was the first in Venice to publish the Index Librorum Prohibitorum. In response, the tribunal decides to merely fine him and order him to perform penance. The Inquisition's seizure of inventory and the forced closure of his shop for six months proves too much for Valgrisi. He chooses to retire and leaves the business to his sons. A few months later, for the fifth time in his smuggling career, Donzellino is brought to trial. Girolamo Donzellino has made his final delivery. In the past, he had been freed after abjuring. But this time, the Inquisition Tribunal finds Donzellino guilty of heretical activities. They turn him over to the secular authorities. He will never be seen again. Killing people doesn't seem to us, generally speaking, over ideas. It seems to us not to be a very good idea 
after 2,000 years of, of history, I mean, of the history of the West as we know it, that is. And generally, um, uh, so we disapprove deeply of this, this kind of purgation, but it seems to me it is possible to understand it within the context of its times and also to understand it within the context uh, sort of sociological, sociology of religion context, understanding how communities react to threats which they regard to be dire or fatal. People have defended the Inquisition on the grounds that it must be judged in its proper historic context, so that if, for example, people were being burned at the stake in 1500, uh, this can't be viewed from today's perspective, but has to be viewed in a society where this was not that uncommon. Yet, we have to realize that not only were they being burned at the stake, but they were being burned because of their opinion. The crime for which the church was putting them to death in this horrible fashion was that they disagreed with the official interpretation of church doctrine. And this is, in a way, the many, many tragedies of the Inquisition. Continued pressure shuts down most of the presses in Venice. The flow of illicit books coming into the Italian peninsula all but runs dry. All books written by Protestants are placed on the list. So is the Bible in common languages. In 1606, the entire city of Venice is excommunicated. The index of prohibited books will not be abolished until 1966.